So what do I do? Yep. Do I am I just in this part of it? Yep. So if you stand up at the podium, um, did you have anything that you wanted to put on the TV? I actually don't. No, we are just. I'm going to uh, perfect. So this is an open class. Yep. So, so then, once people on. join on here. You should be able to see the um, the chat. No, they're still waiting for people because we've got like three minutes out. But okay. you'll be able to see right here if people ask questions in the chat. All right. Yeah. We'll start okay. with it. Sorry, Larry. Oh, you're wonderful. You are. Very busy. But a crazy reporter. I well. It, Somewhat. Yeah, it, it definitely shifted. Yeah. I don't know who I was last year, but I, you know, I, I don't feel great about that. You know, it's, it's well, just hard. Right? It's harder than it was, and yeah. that's for sure. And it's um, definitely has, I um, feel like we're somewhat back to the. Yeah, I mean, people are really, you know, listening. You got a handhold, you got to nurture. And the sale. Yeah, we got a couple minutes, right? Yeah, we're just, we're, this is, I'm going to turn it off. All right, let's see. She said to see if anyone was getting on Zoom. I don't know how to tell these things. Okay. I don't know. You can look down the chat and see if I have a chat and see how many people. Yeah, this is, I haven't done a class in so long that I don't even know. Um, first thing I'm going to do is only erase this. I do have some things that I want to talk about. Let's see. I know Larry's coming in. Um, it is 12 30. I'm just going to give it a few minutes here. We can talk a little bit about it. 
who got snow at their your house this weekend? I did. Yeah. We got a little bit yeah. out as far as we didn't smile. We didn't, we didn't see it. It did stick, but it was shocking when I woke up and it looked yeah. like there was yeah. yeah, slushy snow outside. I didn't know that was coming. Slushy pollen. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, uh, my everything that I've got blooming right now, I'm nervous because my tulip tree, my cherry blossom tree, all that stuff is a little bit. Okay, I think those trees are huge. <laughs> it's so bad for them, so. Okay, so we got Kelly online right now, and just a few of you live here. So uh, thank you for coming. I don't have any handouts because I'm going to start this out with, um, I had a little outline of how I wanted to kind of present negotiations because um, I first of all wanted to start, who has the definition, the definition of negotiation? The Webster's Dictionary <laughs> definition of negotiation. Well, it is by negotiating. What does that mean? It's to have formal discussions with someone in order to reach an agreement. Yeah. And there are, and I'm just kind of going to go through some of my. Uh, hey, Evie. I'm just going to try to go um, through some of the things um, it became apparent late in life and what I found by the time they were able to talk and walk children are master negotiators and if you have if you've had children you'll know and what really got me the first time I realized it not that you don't realize it I think you do realize it but my daughter comes up to me one day and she said let's have ice cream. Now, mommy, can I have ice cream? And I thought, that's a good one. <laughs> because it's not yes or no, it's not a question. Let's have some ice cream. <laughs> so my kids have taught me that they, they, they'll they negotiate me right up until bedtime. I, don't, I mean, that's just part of it. So, so the definition is of uh, negotiating is, like I said, um, you want to reach, you know, to have a formal discussion with someone in order to reach an agreement, okay? So that's basically what us real estate agents do, but you have to remember you're going to be negotiating, not just with your, for your buyer and seller. How many of us negotiate to get a listing? How many of us negotiate to get a buyer? So, you know, negotiating is, is in every aspect of this business from, I think, um, from just trying to get it, the listing all the way down. So um, I think part of what I like to do is when I think about negotiating, and this was happened when I was a broker in charge, when I would get a lot of people would call me up with situations that they were in and they'd rattle on and on and on about, you know, from point A to whatever, and I'd say, stop. What does your buyer want? Because they'll go through, this is what happened and, and this, but or the seller, same thing. Let's find out what they want in the end. Let's let's get from the end and work backwards. So when I negotiate things, and, and we're coming into a market now where we're going to see negotiations from from um, listings, your sellers are going to have to give, and your buyers are going to have are, are expected to get something out of it. So what I think of now is it's it's really our belief system. I I start out with how are we going to make this a win win for everyone. How we're going to compromise. And in every negotiation, too, and I've been there, be prepared to walk away. That's something we need to talk to our buyers and sellers on. And it's always best to negotiate in person. I personally, if I'm going to be putting an offer in on something, or if I'm going to um, count, you know, when I, or, or I'm going to get offers, phone get in front of them. They say to get face-to-face, -face, but that's really hard in this day and age anymore. But I hate getting a text from somebody negotiating. I think it just comes across so brash. And I think it's sometimes the wording. And if you're anything like me, I have fat fingers and autocorrect takes over sometimes. And then the next thing you know, you said something you didn't mean. <laughs> mm -hmm. And 
I have done this just this year. I sent a counter offer on something to the wrong person in a multiple off, not this within the year, to the wrong agent. So I always think it's best to pick up the phone if you can and talk about How it. that go for you? Huh? How does that go for you? <laughs> I was like, sorry, Rob. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, and I have that fears. I have to just autocorrect all the time. So, um, and you have to also listen before reacting. I think part of negotiation too, I, can, I can't tell you how many times you just take a breath before someone is um, uh, coming at you with something. And they want something, and, and you know, just sometimes take a breath or just, you know, and, and be polite. Say, look, I have to think about this or whatever. Take your time. Don't do an knee jerk reaction on this negotiation. I had um, the farthest, um, I've had two of them. I had one just this year and one in the beginning of my real estate. The offer came in $135,000 less than what the asking price. And then this last one I just closed, the first offer came at $115,000 less than my asking price. Ask me if I got those deals to work. The answer is yes. Because I didn't do the knee jerk reaction. I didn't, you know, I, I finally, you know, we worked through the negotiating part of it. You know, in the end, did the buyer really want the house in the end of the seller? And I tell my sellers sometimes too, because, you know, they like to, especially in this market, they're still having a hard time coming off the price that we saw a year ago. Um, so I, I throw that onto the plate, like, you know, Mr. Seller, there's only two people in the world that are gonna determine the price of this house. And number one, what the buyer's willing to pay for it and what you're willing to let go of it. If that meets, that's how we're gonna sell this house. So that's what I do there. Um, but what I'd like to talk about a little bit is since we're coming into a market that I feel like it's not it's not the exact same market that we're coming into that we were in 2008, 9, and 10. And um, I'd like to give you the four differences because I don't think any of you were in that market. But back when we went through the last recession, um, I have to check the Okay. I'm just checking chat to see if y'all have any questions or just chime in. <laughs> Back in the last downturn or market shift that really was the fact that there was four things that are different today that are not, that are were happening um, back then. First of all, we had an overabundance of inventory. We do not have the inventory that we had back that we have today. Second of all, the other difference is that we had rents back then, and I remember this, where rents were in the five and six hundred dollars out of the month, and we were trying to put our um, buyers in homes where their mortgage was going to be nine hundred dollars a month. Right now, rents still pretty much exceed or very close to exceeding what a mortgage payment would be. That's number two. Number three, we didn't have we don't have the influx of foreclosures, REOs, HUDs, and all of that that we did back when I was doing it in 09, 10, 11, We had um, 20, 20 percentage to 25% of our market was distressed property. And then the last one is right on the tip of my tongue, and I know four of them. Um, oh, we still have buyers too. We still have buyers in this market. So, so leading into, um, let's lead into, what do you guys want to start with? Sellers first or buyers first? Or do you, what do you want me to know? Buyers. Let's start with buyers first. That's where everyone's going to work with. Okay, so now that we're coming into a little bit of a market change, uh, there's a couple things. Um, and so when you're going to sit down and have a conversation with a buyer, um, it's really more important now than ever to find out what their um, cash financing money on hand that they have to use and the type of loan program. Because when we're negotiating uh, with buyers, um, it's price, terms, and conditions. I've always told everyone that it's price, terms, and conditions. I've seen uh, a seller tell me at a, at a, at a job listing, I'm, I'm not going below 500,000, right? And we'll take an offer for 490 because it's two weeks, cash close, and that so it's always that it's 
They'll tell you it's price, but it's always terms and conditions on there. Uh, but it's really important, I think, for us buyers because, say, for instance, we get the buyer, we get them under contract, right? And we get the inspections done, and all of a sudden we see a litany of at least, I don't know, $15,000 in repairs. And I'm throwing a high figure out there. And the seller says, Well, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you as an allowance. What's the first thing you should be doing <laughs> with that? Talking, if they're, if they're getting a loan, you need to talk to that lender. Because what's going to happen is the loan program that they're going with will maybe only allow $5,000 in seller paid closing costs or $7,000 in seller paid closing costs. And now you've got a problem because of, because now um, they're going to leave money on the table. That actually happened to me. me. I left $500 on the table on my second house. Because the seller was going to give me $5,000 in lieu of carpet replacement, paint, and all that kind of stuff. We got to the closing table. My husband and I did a VA, and they only allowed the money that we could that we put up and into it. We couldn't take more back off the table. So I ended up leaving $500 on the table. Good for the seller. Bad for me. <laughs> And it's not just that, it's what the lender will require on that. So, so it's pretty important to find out what their what their um what type of loan and all that kind of stuff. So I really don't have an outline. I kind of wanted to do kind of an open forum a little bit to see like what you're struggling with out there. Um on that. And does anybody want to uh well let's start. So what, let's say we're putting in an offer. What are you guys doing when you put in offers now? When you're when you're submitting them? I mean, we're all yeah. yeah. I'm calling I'm calling the agent right away. Right. I'm calling yeah. the agent right now and say, hey, you know, I've got a client right now. I'm going to put in an offer. And is there anything that you know that the that, that they will find favor? Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's something special to tell them yeah, of course you want to build that relationship. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because that makes such a difference. We, I just run a multiple offer situation because I have that relationship built in beforehand, and mm -hmm. it, yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that's what I mean. Phone calls, mm -hmm. you know, just the communication. So when we go through the um, and I wrote this down too. So when I when I look at when I think in my mind when I'm doing this, I'm always like win win or no deal. What's the compromise? It's always give take. Be prepared to walk away, or at least at least educate your seller and buyer how things can walk away. You know, do I get to keep the due diligence, whatever? Uh, negotiate in person, or at least in a conversation on there, and always listen before you react. That's a big one. That's a big one. I think even in non-negotiations when things go wrong, but always listen first, and then focus on the outcome. I I have one. I have a client right now that I'm constantly pulling her back into, and you know, it's it, she she tends to go off on a spider web on things that are going wrong and why do I have to do this? And then I let her complain or I let her talk. And then I'll say, well, look, isn't it going to be exciting when you get into your brand new house? We want to focus on what the outcome is going to be, you know, and how to get there. So you have to kind of reel them in. It's the same thing with the sellers. You know, I've been in it long enough to have literally. Literally had a moving truck. My sellers, it was the day before closing, they had their truck loaded and ready to move. And I get a phone call from the buyer's agent that we're not closing. Make that phone call to your seller. <laughs> that was a tough one. We ended up switching lenders, ended up, anyways, it ended up closing two weeks later, but it was not fun. It was not a fun situation at all. Um, so, so when you're when you're negotiating, like I said, the negotiation really starts when you're trying to win your buyer and seller. Then the second negotiation starts when the house is thinning, and you're going to have to talk to your seller about a price reduction. You know, after you take the feedback, buyers, you're going to have to negotiate on. You know what? Every time we look at houses, you know, you what you're looking for. Isn't fitting your price, you know. So, so that that's not right too. Um, 
but I guess I'm counting on you guys to tell me where do you need help? I'm a coach. I'm I'm one of those. I'm going to tell you right now. I am not. I always believe that you're going to catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. I am. If I'm being recorded, I'm not really a hard ass <laughs> with anyone out there. I'm a. The question for you, well, you were saying before you began, and what one of the notes I wrote down here was you began negotiations in your initial presentations to your client. Okay. Because it depends on which route they want you to take. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be a hard negotiator or, or not? How compromising are they going to be? Well, that's what you missed the very you missed the very beginning. But what right. we talked about was first of all, we talked about that if you're a parent. <laughs> Negotiation. If you have children, you've you've been negotiating with your children since, and then when you're when you're also um, start out with a seller or a buyer to get that listing appointment, what are you doing? You're negotiating with yeah. them to get the buyer. You're negotiating with them, and then it's really important. You know, it's real. I think too, it's important to sit down with your either side. But let's just start with buyers. Sit down and really find out what they're looking for because you know what you have to give them the good, bad, and ugly. If they want, if they have a three hundred thousand dollars, if they have a beer budget and have champagne interest, that's where you really gotta set them set them into. Uh, they, we're just not gonna find that out there for you, you know. But people will buy a bottom in the process of substitution. I'll never forget the, the sweet couple I had, and they had a must have list with a two car garage. First floor bedroom. I'm trying to think of some other things they had in there. We walked into it. She picked this house and and I showed it. And I was thinking, it only has a one-car garage. We got out of that house and she was like, I want to write an offer. I said, Well, it doesn't have a two-car garage. She said, But look at this kitchen. She said, I can she didn't care about her husband not having this, but look at this kitchen. This is the kitchen that I've been looking for. And we ended up buying the house. So they think sometimes getting them out there, they're going to negotiate in their own mind. Oh, yeah. I guess they do their own negotiating. That answer your question, Zach. Well, it's I was going to go a little bit farther in regards to it, but that's that's fine. That's fine. Good. I, what I want the point I was making is in regards of is not only the relationship between agents, you've got to have the relationship between your client and yourself in order to know which way to go and how to go. You're going to be diversified because as you're dealing with more clients you have to treat you can't treat it's not a cookie cutter no it's you, not it's you, not you a cookie cutter. that's where you got to find out what the end goal is too yes. what's focused with their 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 objective is i mean and we all know it's different to work with investors than it is to work with people that are their owner occupying you know um that's a different end goal that they have you know they want to know how much they can get out of the rent investors do or how much is this area going to appreciate? You know, what will I be able to sell the house in five years? And an owner occupant may be worried more about where their kid's going to go to school or how long is the commute for my job? Or, you know, so, and y'all know that. I'm not telling anybody in the classroom or online anything different there. So, um, but again, I always go back to that win win mentality. And, and like when I got that 115,000, just this, I mean, I just closed that house. In February, but we got came in a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars less than our asking price, and we got them to twenty thousand less than our asking price. What was so, the point? Five ninety nine. <laughs> that one was a tough. I, you know, you have to present any and all offers. But you know what I said to him because we got we finally got an offer, and he was fiscal for a while. And he finally, we got that first offer. And I said, you know, someone liked your house enough to put in an offer. That's what I said to him. I said, you're not going to like the price, but we can work on the price. We have somebody that liked your house enough to put in an offer. And we went back and forth for the longest time on it. Did the agent call you beforehand? He did. He did call me. He goes, I've got it. And that, that really helped because if he had just sent me that offer, was not even a, I mean, even if it was just a text. Without that phone call, that made all the difference in the world. I mean, he could have sent me a text, I'm sending me an offer, you know, on the text, and it had come in that long. But instead, he called me and said, you know, I've got an offer. They've really thought about it. They really like the house. He's going to look at it twice. Um, and that really helped. That really helped because I, I managed to, you know, and I told him that based on experience, I said, honestly, I said, I've had offers, and I did, come in lower 
um, and we've managed to make it work out. So, of course, he had the knee-jerk reaction. He didn't want to counter, and he didn't have to. But what I said is, said, well, why don't you just counter back full price and tell them we're still interested, but you better come back with a better offer. You know, we're just going to counter back full price at this point. We're not going to make any movement, but we still want you in the game. And actually, the agent on the other one, I called to tell them what we're going to do. He goes, thank you. Let me let me talk to my buyers. Mm -hmm. So he knew that it wasn't going to be like, at least he could stay in the game. I felt like he felt like this. Maybe we can make the swing win for both sides. On there. Um, but one of the things I do want to bring to your attention because of, of the, the, the things that are different in this market as of 2008, 9, and 10 um, is we've got to be very careful on when we're giving allowances again because of, of that. But it's not, we're, we're seeing it. I just have that house that the house that we did come in, we did end up having to give $5,000 worth of repairs. But we knew that. Um, well, you're gonna have to pay attention to the loan that they're getting because it, it was, they were putting 20% down. So I knew 5,000 coming back wasn't gonna hurt it with the appraisal at all on that. So, um, what else do I have to know in here? I think, I think the other thing with negotiations too is the communication and, and trust. And another one in here, which again goes with our belief system, probably. So, y'all gotta help me out here. Anybody okay. online? Because I don't know what you. Let me just please. Can you justify um, seller concession versus dropping the price? Like when for when marketing for when you're when you have it on so the market when or when you when you're on the contract, they're going for negotiations back and forth, and. Like in what situation would you say, hey, we're gonna do I guess that would be dependent on the seller, maybe a little bit more. Okay, are you under contract or are you just trying yeah. to market it? Okay. okay. Contract. We've done inspections, that's where we are. So two th there's two things that are tailored on that. All right. So I'm just gonna can we just use five thousand dollars? Yeah. Okay. So say you you're you you know what your buyer wants. Ultimately they either want the work done or they want five thousand dollars. Right. And they want an allowance or do they want them to come off price? We don't, I okay, so those are probably your three options. And yeah. you can talk to your buyer about that. A couple things though, if it's $5,000 allowance, mm -hmm. then um, you're gonna have to talk to the lender, like right. especially in 100% financing because you know they can't take more money off the table. Right. I don't know if you looked at like uh, Ryan and probably Justin's loan too, and on the down payment yeah. assistance, they can't take more than $500 back off of closing, right. all that. So you have to know that. Yeah. Uh, if you go off the price, which you can do that change, as long as it's lower, yeah. and you'll then, have to run that through their lender too. Yeah, this one too, we're still waiting on the appraisal. And this one I'm like, I'm glad you said that. Um, works at, I told my buyers, because it was multiple offers, and I told them, I was like, I am not confident it's going to replace for this. And so they knew that going in. Um, so that I'm just kind of turning my wheel to see, you know, if it does come in lower, if we should do, if we should ask them to drop the price or. So that's a very good point, Taylor. And as a rule, if you ever do a deal with me, mm -hmm. you're not going to see me. My, and I'll tell my buyer because we'll, you know, everything happens in a domino. Like maybe the appraisal comes back and it's too low, and then all of a sudden there's infections, you know. But what I don't like, if I'm a listing agent, what I don't like is the agent coming to me and saying, "Oh my gosh, we have all these repairs," you know. I would like we're going to do the DRA. Okay, well, has the appraisal been? And because I don't want to double, I don't want to double hit myself. Right. Yeah. Same thing with my buyer to say, "Look, before we panic." Mm -hmm. And before everything goes, we we still wait. What if the house and what if the house appraises for more than that's, what that's your right. what you're buying yeah, for? Or what if it appraises less and then you've got repairs? So you've got to yeah. you, know, you got to kind of educate your buyers on okay, here's where we're at. But I I like to put it all in one nice little pretty package. Yeah, absolutely. And say you know based you know the appraisal came in ten thousand dollars low. We have two thousand dollars worth of repairs. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to sit with my buyer and say, okay, what do you want to do? Where, where do you want to see this end? And then we can go back. And then sometimes I'll say, well, let's let's do this. So, so the and or, I've done this before. We would like to either have um, 
I've done this on offers too. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll come in at 200 with 5,000 in closing, or we'll come in at 195. So the seller doesn't really make much of a difference because right. we're still going to net the 195. So that's mm -hmm. another way to negotiate coming in for buyers. Let the seller decide. It also it also in a way has prepared made the the listing agent prepare the seller if there is an allowance how that kind of all works out and that's out for them and stuff but yeah I don't like to now I just had one happen to me though uh this two weeks ago um the buyer the appraisal came in on a, the appraiser went in on Monday the inspections were scheduled for Friday on Wednesday I get a call from the agent and he said we got a problem and I said, what? He says, the appraisal came in $1,900 less than what we were in the contract for. And I said, Tommy, I said, he goes in and they want to come, your seller come off that price. I said, but Tommy, I said, I haven't seen the inspections yet. He goes, I don't like to do it this way either, but they're not going to pay for the inspection. Mm -hmm. Oh, no way. It was, it was a good, he goes, we're not going to pay for the inspections unless we know the seller is going to come off the price. So, um, but I had, I have a really good rapport with him mm -hmm. and we had worked through some things and, um, he goes, I said, well, if I go to her with this, I said, we better not get nitpicked on the inspection, a loose receptacle or whatever, because we're coming down. And here's the deal. I had the house listed at 350, got it under contract at 350. A week later, not even a week later, the agent called me on the phone and said, um, her buyer lost his job and that they had to back away from the contract, right? So my seller got to keep the due diligence the next week. So we're, we're running under the gun because she wants to sell it before she doesn't have to, she wants to sell it before she buys. And so she goes, what should I do? I said, well, you need to, you know, you need to lower the price if you want to move this. Cause we already, once you go under contract and then it comes back on the market, you can put in there all day long that the buyer lost his job, but it's still kind of, you know, it kind of misses the, this is the, the spotlight. So we lowered it to, to 344.9. And then the next thing you know, I got it under contract. And then it even, and, and, and I don't know, it was a bad, I looked at the appraisal. And, that, and it's a bad appraisal. He knew it was a bad appraisal. But he also had buyers that said, if you don't know the price, I'm not doing the inspection. Yeah. yeah. I have cringed myself because I've been doing this for uh, 22 years. I have cringed when I pull up to a, a yard sign and I'm like, oh, please don't like this. <laughs> because I have done a deal with the other agent before and I try not to let, and I think I try not to let it show and I let it because I know that they're, they're not tough, but they're just, they're sloppy. You know, I just know how they work. But then I pulled in front of houses where uh, I know the agent, and I'm like, oh great, if you could, I know this is gonna, this is gonna close. You know, I, you know that when you've been in it as long as I have, you know the agent. That's Sam, a Sam woman. She was working out there in buyers, and she's like, I put it off. I'm like, who's the agent? And twice last year, because she's on my team, I called that agent up and I said, my teammate on my team is putting an offer in. Oh, Andy, how you doing? You know, I'm like, well, it's Sam Peterson. She's putting in the offer. I'll be over with, oh, she's great. And we've won offers that way because they know who we are. Again, that's negotiation, right? I mean, it's not like we're, we're already fighting over price terms and conditions, but it's, it's part of the negotiation, so. I'm, I'm just looking over there to see if there's anything on the chat that I should do. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and when you're working with sellers, it's so much nicer to know when you get this, you know, all of a sudden you've got the appraisal didn't come in, you got this long list of inspections and you're sitting there with a the seller or talking to them on the phone or whatever you do. And all of a sudden they're just, they're mad. They're always mad. Mm -hmm. They always want more. They're always mad. You know, there's a, uh, is this going to get recorded out into like our, is this going to stay internal? Because I can always, there's a saying that we used to say that, um, do you remember Carol Sims? Do you remember Carol Sims from over there at Fonville? She used to say, she used to say, sellers are yellers and buyers are liars. Love our clients, right? That's not not the point, but they're all. No, that's the norm. <laughs> and she was 
like 28 or 29 years in the real estate market. Yeah, she used to tell you that. So, but it is nice once you get all that, and then you can sit down with your seller. And again, you know, they're going to be mad. They're going to be upset. They're going to try to, you know, all that kind of stuff. But here we go to number six I have here. Focus on the outcome. Focus on what the outcome is. You know what, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if we can, if we can maybe meet in the middle and give them this and do this, and maybe come down to this price or whatever it is, this is the outcome. This is what you hired them for. You want to, you want to move to the beach, right? Yeah, I found that it for me, it helps like my sellers if they're like all upset or something. Let them have their feelings. Let them back. Validate your you have every right to feel this way, mm -hmm. you know, and then let them get it out. And then say, now let's look at the big picture. So that's kind of what I've done lately, and it's worked. Mm -hmm. You know, you're entitled to that feeling. Mm -hmm. Well, and I and I'll throw it in into uh, um, I'll even say, you know, most people do feel this way when this happens. You know, and so on a buyer, same side. You know what? People that you know, my buyers that are people have always been upset when appraisal joke come in, and it is and it is crappy that it's one person's opinion in one point of time. You know. You got dealt a bad card, but, but here's here's a house. This fits you. It's close to your kid's school. It's right next to grandma and grandpa. Whatever the reason is that they bought it, let's, sure. let's look at the big picture. When you're negotiating, let's say you're on the seller side and you get a low offer. Um, and then the seller is like, well, we'll come down, whatever, because they're probably going to come to this. And then we're going to get, and they go ahead and pre-say that. How do you answer that? So for example, okay, let's say the house was at 550 and the offer was 500 And they're like, okay, well, we'll counter at 540 because they're probably going to come back at 520 and then we're going to come back. At, so they're already, they're saying this out loud to me before we countered. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Well, you it's like they want to build and build. Well, you do have those. I, I've right. had, yeah. Right. They yeah, do too. Yeah, yeah. In certain cultures, that's part of the process. I mean that well, you, like my situation. But, we we had an extreme low offer on Friday night, and I really I really <laughs> thought my people were going to counter Saturday morning, and they festered over it. Even though we ended the conversation great, and they said no, we're not even going to counter. That was their choice, and so I went to the buyer's agent. I said they're not even going to counter, but feel free to submit another offer if you so choose. Well, then they did. They came up a little bit on Sunday. And so now my people, we talked about a price drop in two weeks. Their counter's not even their price drop. So like, well, we're going to go down a little, and they'll probably come up a little, and then we'll come down a little. And my theory was, you would play hardball. You said no. And they came back. Another strategy could be is, this is our best. This is know. your bottom line. Because we've already we've already played hard. We've but, already shown. You know, that's really up to the seller and the buyer. You know. just wanted to the bottom line. Um, Something you can ask the agent on the other side and say, look, you know, we're going to counter back. Would it do you, you know, I, my, I, I advise my seller to come back with their lowest offer. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I just ask, ask the other agent, do you have a good rapport with them? I don't know, but she keeps in her mind, she's just by this house is not worth it. In my mind, the house is. And then my sellers, it's even more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but even though we're more square feet, we're, we're less, there's two other houses in the area. And we're less per square foot than they are. And we're a range and they're not. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot of good things, but in their mind, they don't feel like it's worth near that in their mind. So. I think, I and think, then, of course, there's a lot of other noise going on with, contingencies and all that. Well, we, we don't even have the numbers that. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I have advised my clients and I'm going to do what they said. I don't agree with it, but I'm going to do what they said with a pretty smile. And the, but the other agent, I do have a good report. Yeah. So I would do what your sellers say because there is movement. Absolutely. You're still in negotiation yeah. and, and keep it open. Now you can attest to this, Billy Joe. We had, we, she had submitted a multiple offer. Uh, we had multiple offers and we lost. Remember, we lost. There were four in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> there was like six or seven offers on the table. We lost. We, in fact, we thought we were going to get it, and somebody slipped in an offer on us. Right, so I made the conversation with the agent. I said, you know, if something goes bad or something goes wrong, you know. And she was working with us, 
two weeks, was it two weeks later? Two weeks later, she called us on the phone. And she said, did your buyer find anything? And, and if she didn't, would she be interested in this house? And we hadn't found anything and she was still interested. So that report goes, and we're, and we're closing next Monday. That report goes a long way from that agent because the last thing they want to do is put it back in seller store. They've already started packing boxes. They've already started, you know, the house isn't show ready. They start letting their underwear stay on the floor and, you know, that put their toothbrush away. They don't, you know, that, that, that's a lot of work to have your house show ready. So yeah, it's always good. It's always good to stay in the report. Sometimes you have to bite your tongue over it, but, but yeah, so. Um, actually, let me write these six points down that I have just on the board, just so y'all can kind of see how I do it in my mind when I'm doing it. So like I said, I always do win, win, or no deal. And then what the compromise is going to be. Um, and then again, be prepared to walk away. I mean, like say for instance, the people that you're negotiating with right now, Right, you put the counter. They're buyers. There's, what do you, they're still online looking. They're still looking at houses. They may not come up. We, I've had that happen. I'm negotiating. From the agent calls me. She's like, guess what? We went to look at another house yesterday. We hadn't made the deal. We we're too far apart. She goes, they're going to withdraw and buy something else. So your sellers need to know that that can happen, especially in this market. I did have a question also from a point that Yeah. Okay. So if you're the listing agent and you do have an attorney that you prefer to use because there's been like a death and all that and the attorney's already done the work, is it traditional that the seller pay for the attorney? Then, because that was one thing they said, they said, we want you to pay closing costs. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Said, well, you're requesting your attorney. So we're requesting that you pay that. Because they can still use their own attorney. And that's what I, that's what I said. They can still use their own attorney. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. no, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So, um, yeah. um uh, in person or call. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the other one. Make sure you do this. You know, in person call. You know, the 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 feeding frenzy we just came off of two in the last two years. I can honestly say I barely talked to agents <laughs> when the offers, I had 20 offers come in and they were calling, but he didn't tie. So, you know, but I think we're coming back to the in-person or call. We got to get away from the texting again and always listen first before reacting. And if you're one of those ones that do have a knee-jerk reaction or a hot temper, maybe you, you, you need to like, so let me call you back in 10 minutes or and a half an hour or something if you're that angry. I just I just don't believe that half that I never see anything good about the half an hour of it between anybody. And and honestly, you set the temperature. I think I can't tell you how many times I'll get a phone call and you know it's bad news or something's not going right and I get off the phone and I'm like, oh, 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 oh. then you just kind of like yep. get back up the phone <laughs> and because if you're your buyers or sellers see you upset or mad or angry, you set the tempo on it. So listen before reacting. And then always focus on the outcome. That, that to me is probably focus on the outcome. You know, which again, if they walk away, that might end up being the, the outcome. On that. So, but one thing I do want to make sure everyone understands is now that we're coming into a market, though, that we are going to see negotiating, repairs, price, move in dates. We're not going to see as many seller possession after closing and stuff like that. We, we really have to keep our lenders involved unless they're paying cash. We have to keep all parties involved on that because I hate to see anybody lose money on the table because, like I said, that happened to me before. On that, let's see what else that I have. And then you, you know, and part of your negotiating is building the integrity, integrity and trust between your buyers and sellers. Okay, let me check the chat button. Let's see if there's anything in there. Does anybody want to bring up some scenarios or situations that you're in that maybe I can help with? Anybody on Zoom? Hey, Amy. This is Dawn. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about the other option for negotiations for your buyer where you have them pay directly for repairs to the vendor at closing? Okay. Oh, very good one. Okay. That's another good one. Um, so if you, you're going to have to work with the attorney to set up some escrows on there. Um, so say, for instance, the seller says, well, you know, I've got $10,000 I'll give you to repair the foundation. Um, that money's going to come out of the seller and it's going to be set aside in an escrow account at the attorney. Or the check could be made directly. And I don't like to do that, though. I'm not going to lie down. I've had, I don't like the checks to be made payable to the contractor because the contractor can take it and never do the work. Yeah. The attorney holds the money until the work's done and everything mm -hmm. pays it. So. And they'll oh, and Don, they'll, yeah. yeah, and they'll do an escrow agreement for the work. Um, now I've had one, was it you, Melissa, that we set up an escrow agreement for you? <laughs> Just in here. We and I can't remember, was it over or under the amount? I think we had to give some money back, didn't we? No. 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 Okay. So a lot of times what they'll do is in the escrow agreement, they'll have uh, ten thousand dollars for work done, and if the if it'll be in the escrow agreement that if the money say it only costs ninety five hundred dollars, well, who does the five hundred dollars go to? Well, it should go back to the seller. So they'll write that in the agreement. Do you, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I haven't. Ha I haven't done an escrow agreement on the ones that I've done. I've just gotten the quotes from the vendors that my clients have decided they want to use for the work, and so there's a check generated by the attorney. For that exact amount that either a the buyer holds on to until the work is completed i, I don't think we've ever sent it actually directly so to the, the is, vendor what loan is your uh, buyer doing um let's see uh it's been a couple different That's ones one was conventional i'm trying to remember if the other one was a va um yeah wow. you, yeah i would definitely let the um pull the, the lender in it just because if the money goes to the actual buyer they may see that as money going to the buyer and they don't get a big no no. They do not. Lenders Even if the check is not written to the buyer? If it's not written to the buyer, then it should probably go into an escrow agreement. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the safest route. It's the safest route because remember, RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, everything has to be on the um, CD. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. it's noted on there as a payment to that vendor. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, ultimately, it's between the buyer and seller on that. If no money is going back to the to to the buyers, then you're good that way with the loan. And if it's on on the CDs, then you're good. My only concern is only because I've gotten burnt before, and it may not happen. Is what happens if it's not enough money? What happens if it's too much money? Where does that money go back to? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start seeing a lot of that. I'll tell you, I've been going into a lot of new construction sites these days, and they are master negotiators because they have got everything covered. They've got the $10,000, the appliances, the two for one buy downs. I mean, they're just really offering everything out of, under the sun for our buyers right now. They're pretty much, it's, it's not like it was two years ago. <laughs> We're back to seeing, and then, yeah, it's been or off the price. They're really negotiating hard to pull these buyers away from retails, and it's working. It really is working. And that, you know, let's go to to listings on that. The one thing I would do if I'm, and I'm actually going to be a listing appointment Saturday, but um, the nice house too, from the outside, from what I can see. But I'm going to tell them, look, you know, you got new construction all around you. Here's what they're offering. You know, they're offering. Five thousand, ten thousand dollars. You know that's going to be part of what I'm going to prepare my people for negotiating, especially if their house is in top shape. I don't know. So, throw some more at me. 
what Joanne, are, you've been doing this. Okay, go ahead, Taylor. Uh, what are your top, um, I guess, tactics on the buy side? Um, if your client does want to do um, ask for concessions and move repairs, what are your tactics to have the seller accept it? Do you do anything specific? Well, again, I, so normally what I do is if I have a really good working relationship with that, that agent, um, a lot of times, if it's, so I'm guilty. I'm just going to tell you right now, whenever I'm dealing with an agent on the other side of a transaction, the first thing I do is I look at their license number. Mm -hmm. It tells me a couple things. It tells me how long they've been in it. And then sometimes we look to see how many deals they've done. Because if I'm coming after, if my buyer, if that's what their, their, their outcome wants to be, they want the repairs done. And I feel they're very, uh, they're, you know, because, you know, their material facts now, the sellers are going to disclose it. I will, sometimes I'll go after it that way. You know, if they don't fix it, it's going to be disclosed um on the other side and most agents know that i mean you guys all sitting here are probably wins agents to know that but some of these new agents don't seem to know that that's what's going to and so you have to educate yourself so go ahead for that part of it number one um it depends on how you presented the first offer what did you do when on the repairs i mean how oh it's multiple offers wasn't it and you have everything bundled already you have the you don't have the appraisal yet not yet mm -hmm. We have inspections on Friday, so we're just waiting for the appraisers to come back. Um, so, and then go from there. What's your buyer's mental state right now? Good. <laughs> <laughs> no. So they're very panicked they're, over. They're freaking out about the appraisal. Um, no, I mean with the repairs, with the inspection. Inspection, I, there was nothing major that came up. I mean, within the next year or so, there will probably be the new roof. Um, it is probably. 25 ish years old, um, but there's no visible sign of damage, there's no leakage, like there's nothing wrong with it right now. Um, and then the other thing was, um, right on the vapor barrier, which they could do themselves, um, and then some erosion around the crawl space with the home needs gutter. What about home warranties? Have you thought about looking at the home warranties? I that about that, yeah. Yeah, that's another one. And if you can't get your, well, if you work with a seller and you can't get them off and doing some of the repairs, you can also have them offer some home warranties and lose. Yeah. Um, Ideally, I'd like, depending on where the appraisal comes back to, <laughs> um, I'd like to get them at least a few grand for gutters. That way they have the money to put gutters on the home right away mm -hmm. if it needs it. Um, I mean, other than that. Oh, here's another thing too that, that I'm sorry, Taylor, but make sure uh, with your buyer's permission, I always send over the home inspection reports because that way, now guess what? The seller knows because, yep. Even if we don't ask for anything, I always send it over. I always send over the report when home inspection reports when they come in. Yeah, if I'm the if I'm working with a buyer, um, now I don't if the termite clean or the radon treatment okay, I don't usually bother with that. But if you have a especially septic home inspection, the septics are bad. Home inspections, you know, have a lot or something like that. I send it over. I'll actually sometimes I'll even call the agent. Say, look, I'm just going to send over this home inspection report just so you have it. <laughs> <laughs> just so you have it we haven't really had a time to sit down and review it but then what i've done is now and we may or may not ask for anything they haven't had a chance to review but now it's a disclosure because you you put that listing agent in a position that if we walk away from the deal they have to they have to disclose what they know yeah i had one and it was a small dollar amount anyway and um I will disclose who the agent was, but she was like, um, don't send the inspection report, just tell us what you want. A good agent will tell you that. I've mm -hmm. done that before. Don't send me the home inspection report mm -hmm. unless you're going to ask for repairs. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be put in that position that I know that there's something wrong with that house. Because mm -hmm. if, 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 if it still falls apart, 
now you gotta have that conversation with your seller, like Mr. Right. Mrs. Seller, and we're gonna have to your roof leak, your hot water tank is about ready to explode, whatever it is. Yeah. And if you don't fix it, we're gonna have to disclose it. And they don't like that. Sellers hate that. Yeah. Yeah. On there. So did you send over the home inspection reports already, Jim? We're supposed to get them today. Okay. Well, and then when you when you have that conversation with the buyer, you can say, look, I've got that report. We're not going to do anything about it, but with your permission, can I go ahead and send it over just so they can take a look at it and get some labor work if they want to? Yeah. And it's the same thing. And back when I was doing, um, back in the last Friday, we used to get the appraisals before anyone would. Now we're in a market where we don't even get the appraisals. The appraisals go right to the buyer. Mm -hmm. And then the buyer either has to afford them and, and, and try to call a lender to send it to you. Now, the ones that we have really good working relationships with it will let us know, but typically you have to fight to get the, not fight, but you just have to ask for it on mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Amy, I have a question, Amy. Yeah. Are we really um, allowed to say that to buyer's agent? Well, uh, if, if you want to say, I don't want to receive a copy of the inspection report only if you have repairs. Are we allowed per you know ruling of North Carolina Real Estate Commission? Well, you're allowed to say I don't want to see their report until you know, but an um, an agent can still send it to you. <laughs> want to keep that relationship, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I typically, as a rule, I typically send it, um, and I send it with uh, with a stipulation or with them knowing that I'm not asking for anything at this time. I'm just, I'm just saying an FYI, here you go. We don't have all the reports in. And I let my agents on the other side know if I'm a buyer's agent that, um, and that's the other thing I say, we're not, you know, we don't have the appraisal back, all the rest of the reports, I just wanted to send this to you. And, and I let them know we're not gonna do anything until we have everything. And if that's how I like to do it. That's how I like to receive it. Because I know I have one big hurdle to, to jump. I don't like to jump over, oh, we got passed. Okay, then the next report, we've got a roof leak. And then the next report, they I, 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 that's just too much. It's too much. But. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. There's got to be more of you that have questions on what to do in certain situations. Hi, Sheena. We've got about five minutes if you guys want to pick my brain on anything or anything outside of negotiation. Hi, Amy. Sorry, <laughs> my phone. <laughs> That's okay. Or ask me anything. Mm -hmm. What's that program? Ask, call, ask me. can't remember what it's called. Ask me anything. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm around my kids too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amy. Um, I like how the point you said about um, not um, requesting any repairs until you receive your, the rest of your reports and appraisal. Now, in the case of the due diligence period, um, how do you feel like as far as say the appraisal doesn't come in within that time period that you put, how do you approach that? Well, that, that's a tough one, Sheena. We're always fighting that one. That is not one that's an easy one to fight. That's why we try to get as much due diligence on the time on the front end of the contract, or we're going to have mm -hmm. to extend it. Okay. Um, the other thing is, so the other thing about the package, let's, let's say I'm the buyer's agent, I've got all the reports, I've got the appraisal, and if I can get one more thing, when I call that, that agent and send over everything that my buyer wants, I'd like to say, and We've got low commitment. If we can just get through this, we're going to closing. And there's nothing easier when you're a listing agent, when you go to your, your sellers and say, you know what, here we are. You know, they, this is what they want repaired. Uh, we have, you know, thousand, it was a thousand dollars off on the appraisal. But the good news is, again, focus on the outcome. They've got low commitment. If we can make this work, we're going to closing. Mm -hmm. And so it's so much nicer to have all that. Now I know it's it, 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 it's not always easy and it's not always perfect, but it does make it a lot easier. 
to have all that put together. And don't forget, guys, I should have brought the warranties. The whole warranties are coming back, and that's a big one. I mean, that should probably be in the front end of your offers as well. And if you're working with sellers, I think it's something that we should be, you know, highly encouraging them to have um, an offer, especially, you know, if, if that comes in with that, I don't know, like, look, if there's something silly on the home inspection report that this home warranty is going to cover, we've got, you know, we've got the safety net there. So, and we didn't have a lot of home warranties the last two years. We didn't have a lot of due diligence time in the last two years. And I'm seeing, and I'm going to ask me anything, I'm seeing due diligence amounts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I mean, we're talking like a, uh, I had a, you know, $300,000 house and we took a $2,000 due diligence check. I mean, that's pretty low. It took and, more than 300000 And it was, and, they, and they're doing the whole three weeks, you know? So was there talking, earnest money there too, Amy, or just the due diligence? Uh, they put up, they did put up some earnest money, yeah, because they're doing a funny loan, yeah, yeah, and that's going to depend too, you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, hopefully, I think we're going to see a lot of VA loans come back in the market, we're going to see a lot of USDA loans come back in the market, um, and those are 100% financing, um, so, you know, that appraisal bid is going to be really important to these 100 percenters. Because they typically don't have a lot of the money to make up the difference. As a rule, you're going to see a lot of first time home buyers come back in the market. One thing that I'm going to focus on is the down payment assistance programs that are coming back in the market, too. That's another one. And you're going to have to know I, I, I'm not confident enough in those yet again mm -hmm. to go and negotiate for my buyer. I think if you get one that's doing the DPA program, I think you need to have a long conversation with your, with that lender and say, what are the terms? Because historically for me, when we did them, and the last one I closed, the house had to have certain mechanics that were operating top notch or they would not fund the loan. And that's just something to be aware of on both sides. So if I get an offer and somebody's doing a DPA, I'm down payment assistance with the DPA. I'm going to want to know what kind of program, what are they going to look at? Because a lot of times they'll send in their, their third-party inspectors and they'll expect it to be repaired prior to closing. It's not a, an allowance. It has to be repaired to close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so anybody else, anything, anything outside of negotiation? <laughs> well, y'all are an easy class today. Very easy. Okay. Well, thanks for joining in. How do I, what I do? Everybody have a good week. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Have a good one. And thanks, Edie. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. I'm yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Amy. <laughs> <laughs>